Just give a few more seconds. All right, good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar presented by the Mid-Atlantic Planning Collaboration. We are thrilled to have you today for this presentation. I'd like to share a couple of announcements and general reminders before we get started. Don't forget to register for next month's Your Hour with APA Virginia webinar, which will be, or this month, sorry, um, which will be presented on December 13th from 12 to 1 p.m. This is a week early due to the holidays, so please mark your calendars to note this change. All information about our upcoming webinars can be found online at virginia.planning.org, as well as links to registration. This recorded webinar can be found on the Mid-Atlantic Collaboration page YouTube site, which is also linked on our website. We encourage you to submit questions throughout the presentation in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. When we move to the Q&A portion of the presentation, we will take your questions in the order that they were submitted. If you would like to ask a question live to our presenters during the Q&A session, please use the raise your hand feature at the bottom of your screen, and I will let you un your, unmute yourself to speak directly with our presenters. With that, I will now introduce our session and our two presenters. Today's webinar is land use law update. This session will summarize recent case law with respect to land use law. After attending this session, participants will be able to, one, identify current legal issues, Two, describe how recent cases may apply to local ordinances and issues. And three, collaborate with the local government attorney to develop legally defensible local government land use policies and ordinances. Today, we are joined by Jared Anderson, JD AICP. Jared received a BA in geography with a minor in economics from West Virginia University, where he was a member of the WVU men's tennis team. After graduating, he worked as a GIS specialist for an engineering firm, firm in Virginia. Later, he moved out west to attend the University of Hawaii, where he obtained a Master of Urban and Regional Planning. In 2007, he moved back to Virginia to become the planning director for the town of Chicoteague. While there, he was responsible for the day-to-day -day planning activities, including a complete revision of the town's comprehensive plan. Most recently, he obtained a JD from the Catholic University of America Columbus School of Law in Washington, DC. We are also joined by Jesse Richardson. He is a professor of law at West Virginia University College of Law and the lead, lead land use attorney at the Land Use and Sustainable Development Law Clinic. He previously taught in the Urban Affairs and Planning Program at Virginia Tech. Great. I will now pass this on to our presenters. Thank you, Taylor, and thank you, everybody, for joining us this afternoon. We're going to have a fun afternoon, at least it will be for me and Jared, uh, talking about some um, interesting land use cases over the past year or so. Um, and this is uh, sponsored by the Mid-Atlantic Planning Collaboration. Uh, it is um, a collaboration of five state APA chapters, Delaware, Maryland, Pennsylvania, Virginia, and West Virginia, and the National Capital Area chapter, along with four other groups in the Mid-Atlantic region. Uh, it looks like actually five other groups. It's the uh, Maryland Department of Planning, um, the Maryland Planning Commissioner Association, the Rural Planning Caucus of Virginia, the WV Land Use and Sustainable Development Law Clinic, and the Chesapeake Bay Program. Uh, we got together basically after COVID hit uh, to get together to collaborate on doing some webinars for CM credit. Uh, we did eight webinars in uh, 2020. We're going to do five in 2021. And we've already got a really exciting six-part webinar series on planning for clean water uh, that's going to start in January, and the Chesapeake Bay program is taking the lead on that. Uh, just a little bit about the land use clinic uh, at WVU. Um, we are one of only two land use clinics in the country. 
Uh, we have five attorneys and two A AICP planners on staff. And Jared is both AICP planner and an attorney. Uh, we have lots of public meetings. We help communities with comprehensive plans, um, zoning ordinances and other types of ordinances. Uh, we partner with uh, private consultants and we have the law students involved also, which is really uh, unique and interesting. Uh, good to see we've got at least one planner from West Virginia, welcome today. Um, and let's go ahead and get into some cases. We're gonna start talking about signs because there's a sign case before the United States Supreme Court right now. Telecommunications, RELUPA, uh, some regulatory takings cases, and something that's really come to the forefront just in the past couple of years are some Second Amendment and zoning cases. We're going to talk about that. Just a little bit on short-term rentals because we had a short-term rental webinar a couple of weeks ago. And finally, there are some interesting uh, just general cases on land use, some really interesting ones, as you'll see. So signs. Um, on November 10th, the United States Supreme Court heard oral arguments in the city of Austin versus Reagan National Advertising case. Um, this is the second time that the United States Supreme Court has heard a, a sign case in recent memory. Of course, the most recent prior to this was the Reed case. And this is really a follow up to Reed. And the question is whether a distinction between off-premises and on-premises signs and regulating those signs differently is a content-based regulation that would subject that ordinance to strict, strict scrutiny and it would likely be struck down. Um, they had oral arguments on the 10th um, one thing that was mentioned in the oral arguments was that under a certain interpretation of Reed, the Federal Highway Beautification Act may be unconstitutional. Uh, Whitney Morgan at the clinic, who is our sign expert, actually believes that is the case, that the Highway Beautification Act is unconstitutional. We'll all be waiting to see what the court says here. Um, at the clinic, we have avoided the off-premise, on-premise distinction, and we instead use accessory use instead to get at that, and we think that would pass constitutional muster. Now, I'm going to mention two other sign cases because um, there, there were just two that kind of screamed out to me. And they basically say, yes, the Reed case still applies. Um, and again, Reed says that um, if the ordinance is content-based, then it's subject to strict, strict scrutiny. Talbot County, Maryland had an ordinance that looked suspiciously like the ordinance at issue in the Reed case. It had 10 different categories of temporary signs and the categories were based on content um, and different maximum sizes, different regulation for each. And so not surprisingly, the US District Court in Maryland said, we're gonna apply strict scrutiny and aesthetics and traffic safety are not enough. Um, this ordinance is hopelessly under-inclusive uh, why does a five by five political sign uh, threaten safety uh, while a five by five real estate sign does not? It doesn't make sense. So the Talbert County ordinance was struck down in that case. And then in a Virginia case, it shows that at least some parts of an ordinance can be constitutional under Reed. Um, the Virginia code forbids signs within the limits of any highway, uh, but it lists separate, several exceptions to that. 
And the question is, is that content-based? Well, first of all, the court said, historical markers, warning signs, Red Cross emergency stations and the like, they are government speech and government speech is in a separate category. And basically, I don't want to, I don't want to say that the government can say anything, um, but the government has a lot of leeway on what they can say. So that part of the ordinance was okay. Um, they also allowed signs containing advertisements or notices if they are authorized by the county and securely attached to a public transit passenger station uh, that is owned by the county. And the court said that's okay too because it's content neutral. So we're going to uh, use intermediate scrutiny and time, place, manner restrictions that are reasonable are justified under the constitution. So that was okay. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Jared who is gonna talk about some rather technical telecommunications act um, provisions and then we've got a lot of RLUIPA cases this year don't we Jared? We sure do we sure do um, well I welcome everybody and I was looking in the chat um, the chat function and there's folks from all over the country which is very exciting I saw Florida and Oregon and Kansas City and New York and Pennsylvania that's all great um You'll have to bear with me. I am just um, getting over a, a, um, an illness, and so I might be a little sluggish today, and, um, but I think we'll get through it together and um, keep those, those chats coming in. We love to hear where people are from. So starting off, telecommunications, you all probably heard in the last couple of years that there was, there was some movement, especially out in the Ninth Circuit uh, with the city of Portland, uh, versus the United States, the FCC. And from that case, which was actually a, an amalgamation of several different cases that all got put into the Ninth Circuit case, there's been uh, some anticipation as to what we can expect, uh, especially in re relation to 5G and small cells. And it's been fairly quiet um, in the last year and a half um, from the FCC's perspective. The, there's only a couple rules that I wanted to highlight to you all that I thought might be relevant. The first is rule 20-153. And basically what this rule, it, it came out last year in October, and basically what this rule sort of suggests is that uh, we want to, it, this is kind of in line with how the FCC has treated 5G in the last couple of years. Uh, we want to, to, to facilitate the rollout of, of small cells throughout the, throughout the country. And so the FCC is going to try and provide rulemakings that are consistent with that general thought. And so, um, again, what this rule is saying is that um, it's, and it's an interesting rule because it's a very narrow scope, but it could have profound effects at the local level if local government isn't careful. What I mean by that is, it's only talking about uh, approvals of compound expansion uh, when there's co-location. So what I mean by compound expansion is expansion of the area by which you have the cell tower, the base station, uh, any equipment cabinets, that area, usually it's fenced in. We've all seen those, those areas right below a, a cell tower. What this rule is expanding is that um, if, if the expansion, if the co-location doesn't go beyond 30 feet of the original uh, footprint where, where the equipment is now, if that expansion is within 30 feet, then that, that sort of process falls under 6409A, which means that it's a, that it would probably be a modification for uh, an eligible facilities request for a modification. And so that's, that's really important for local governments to understand that in a situation where 
a cell tower uh, owner wants to expand for co-location purposes and they're only going to expand the footprint just a little bit or maybe 30 feet out that it it falls under the 6409a from the local government perspective we're talking about the shortened shot clock uh, and so to make a decision from the local government's perspective so that's really important for local governments so i, I suggest if, if you're involved in cell towers uh, or know someone who is that they take a, a look at uh, rule 20-153 and see how that might change um, how local government views uh, modifications and if it falls under that protracted or that shortened um, shot clock under 6409A. Next slide, please. This other rule was just this past year, uh, this year actually, and it it's mainly geared towards over the air re reception devices rule. Um, some people say OTARD. Um, this, this rule comes into play in land use and planning, particularly when we're talking about like small satellite dishes. Uh, you see the picture there, um, uh, dish network, direct TV, those kind of things. It, the, the rule is beyond that, but typically where I've seen it come into play with land use and zoning and, and, and those kind of things is, is with the satellite, um, the small satellite dishes uh, for satellite TV or internet, HughesNet, those kind of things. It's important to understand that uh, over the air reception devices rule, which is under the FCC, um, applies not only to uh, governmental uh, organizations, so local governments, but it also applies to uh, non-governmental organizations, some non-governmental organizations, namely HOAs. And so, and, and again, it kind of falls in line with, with the Federal Telecommunications Act and that is sort of a, a federal uh, limitation of how local governments can regulate certain things. And the over-the-air reception devices rule is falls in that sort of same line. There's limitations as to what local governments and certain non-governmental organizations or, or agencies can um, prescribe rules for. So the first part of the rule is that uh, the FCC invalidated the city of Chicago's um, provision that required uh, satellite dishes to be in locations that are not visible from any street adjacent to the property. So they they said that does not that that is that is, that goes beyond the scope of what uh, the over the air reception devices rule allows for local governments to enforce and to regulate, and so they invalidated that provision. Uh, under the city of Chicago. The second part of that rule is that certain hub and relay antennas that were previous, previously outside of, of the OTARD rule are now within. And so there's limitations as to what local governments and uh, organizations such as HOAs can limit in terms of the placement of those things. Uh, this mainly comes into play, the second prong comes into play with fixed wireless. Um, the FCC gave the uh, example of um, providing sort of like a, a central node where the fixed wireless comes in and then it beaming out Wi-Fi upload download to, uh, you know, in a mobile home park situation or assisted living situation where it might be going to different entities throughout like one property. And so, uh, yeah, you can go ahead and move on to the next slide. And so those were the two rules that I thought were relevant to land use planners. The one case that we, we thought was relevant uh, was the Crown Castle Fiber case versus the city of Charleston in South Carolina. This is a federal district court case in two, uh, this year, 2021. And basically what it is, my understanding is that there's been a longstanding conflict between the, the, the company, uh, Crown Castle and the city of Charleston, especially when it comes into um, 5G and small cells. Um, there's been longstanding conflicts. There have been prior uh, court cases. And so this wasn't anything that just came up out of the blue. And one of the things that sort of percolated from this case is 
um, and this is this has come straight from the from the opinion, is that and this is what the, the, the court said, the city had been less than accommodating to a point of near obstructionism, okay? So that kind of puts things into context a little bit, uh, especially from Crown Castle's um, point of view. And Crown Castle claimed that, um, that the, the city's um, small cell ordinance was effectively prohibiting service to the, to the constituents. Um, that the denials were not supported by substantial evidence and that the city failed to timely act on several requests. Next slide. So there's a couple interesting tidbits that I wanted to share with you all in regards to this case. One of the things that Crown Castle argued was that the city wasn't even following its own process or approval of these small cell um, applications approval or denial and they, they they i think it was something like the mayor was approving but the process and the ordinance was suggesting that someone else had to do the that someone some other body or or group had to make the approval and the court said we're not here to talk about whether or not the process is correct i thought that was interesting because it, you know especially coming from a land use um sort of frame of mind uh, if the process is incorrect, um, you know, something, uh, there's something not right sort of foundationally. But the court sort of dismissed that argument from Crown, from Crown Castle and said, we're not here to talk about the process. We're here to review whether the reasons for the denial are rooted in, in local law and sub sub supported by substantial evidence. So I thought that was a really interesting sort of legal tidbit. Um, basically what had happened in the previous case is that um, between Crown Castle and the city of Charleston is that um, the city was the city was arguing that um, the remedy for them not uh, approving or making a decision within the st uh, standard shot clock time was to give us give them more time. Crown C Castle was arguing that since the city didn't make a decision one way or the other within the allotted time shot clock that they should be that the application should be deemed approved the court said in this case no we're going to give the city 90 days we're not going to say that they're deemed approved we're going to give the the, court, the 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 city 90 days to approve or deny and make some sort of decision what happened was and why there's this case is that they approved and denied, but then they conditionally approved some of the, the some of the applications. There are multiple applications, and um, they didn't make an affirmative decision. And so Crown Castle was bringing it back to the court, saying they still haven't made a decision. Ninety days later, and so that's why they were back in into court. And so the the court was getting frustrated because the city hadn't made a decision. Um, but it's really, uh, it really was an interesting case in that, um, you know, the shot clocks are there prescribed by statute, city didn't adhere to them. The court was continually giving the city, uh, multiple opportunities to sort of remedy this without the court coming in and saying, um, you know, it's going to, um, it's going to be, um, too much. So let's move on. Mast Fillmore, uh, Minnesota. This is a this is so we're changing from telecommunications to Relupa. Uh, so we're looking at uh, land use and and uh, religious freedom. This is the Supreme Court of the United States. It is, I think, a fascinating case, one that I would definitely um, uh, suggest that you read over. If nothing else, I thought it was an interesting fact pattern. What we have here is um, a, a group of a uh, sect of Amish that are in southeast Minnesota. Um, we have a county, Fillmore County, again, southeast Minnesota. Um, they've been living and working on the farms for um, heaven knows how long. Uh, the county 
uh, was concerned and had changed their laws to require that gray water be um, sort of put into a septic tank. The Amish in, in this particular sect of Amish in Minnesota uh, are very traditional and don't use hardly any uh, uh, modern technology. And so they came back to the county and said, um, uh, you know, can we get an exemption? We have, we, we for religious purposes, we do not want to, um, or we don't feel like this is an appropriate technology for us to use. And so the county um, didn't really buy that and didn't really accept um, that, that sort of request for an exception and said, okay, well, uh, you guys have six months to, to, to do what we're asking you to do, what is required by, by our ordinance, uh, or we're gonna have you moved out of your property. The Amish came back and said, um, you know, uh, what about this? What about this? Sort of, what about this technology? It's it's approved in other jurisdictions, and, and it and it fits with in line with our religious beliefs. And it was it was a, another way of disposing of gray water. The county did not accept that. I don't think the state of Minnesota accepted that either. And so um, what we have here is a standstill. Um, as Jesse talked about earlier, um, with with in respect to, to sign uh, amendments, uh, sign sign law, is RELUPA also requires strict scrutiny. Okay, next slide. So the question becomes in an analysis of whether or not uh, there's a violation of RELUPA uh, with the Amish and this requirement for disposing of gray water. Um, it's not whether the county has a compelling interest in enforcing its septic requirement generally, but whether it has an interest in denying an exception from the Amish specifically. And so the courts said um, that, that the county should have looked at the specific uh, exception uh, from, the, from the, the Amish and they also said, you know, um, you, you, the county, the, the court said, you, the county, have granted exceptions for other uh, entities and other organizations, and you didn't even acknowledge this exception. And so we feel that this is, this is uh, um, an un, it, it's mischaracterizing RELUPA. And so they, um, they vacated the lower court's decision and remanded it back. Next slide. Abundant Life, Baptist Church, and this is a Missouri case this year. Not much to say on this case. I think the important import is that it was related to COVID-19. There was a public health emergency. Um, as, as you guys may or may not have been part of, depending on where you are in the country, things shut down during COVID. Uh, certain things were open, certain things were closed. And basically what this was suggesting, the church was saying, well, you treated other businesses differently than you treated us. And we weren't able to worship effectively or how we wanted to. It's a violation of a number of things, including RELUPA. And when we're talking about RELUPA, the important thing is here is land use. And so this uh, public health order had nothing, didn't have anything to do with land use. And so RELUPA was just thrown out. And I think that's important point, an important point to, to, to note is that, um, you know, things might seem like they apply, RELUPA might apply, especially if you're treating a church differently, but it's got to be related to land use in some way in order for RELUPA to be effectuated. Okay. Pass a Grill Beach Community Church versus the city of St. Pete, Florida. Um, so the, the church had, had been providing, and it looks like a beautiful place, by the way, uh, never been there. The church provides, uh, parking for, uh, people is right next to the beach and they had been doing it for decades and decades and decades. The, um, <clears throat> the, uh, I guess the city of St. Pete beach, 
um, had there's people that were concerned about uh, I guess something had changed maybe I'm not entirely sure what exactly had changed but something had changed where there had been concerns from adjacent property owners and they brought those concerns to St. Pete Beach. St. Pete Beach uh, said that um, you know the church's parking lot is only for a legitimate church purpose and said that you can't just allow people uh, to park there and go to the beach. And the church comes back and says, um, it is a legit, legitimate um, church purpose for us to, to uh, allow people to park here at the beach. Next slide, Jesse. And, the, and that was sort of the crux of the argument. The two parties, the city and the church agreed on almost everything. Uh, there's really no fact pattern or anything that they disagreed with. And I think this is a really interesting thing. They really just, just agree, they really just disagreed on one important point. It's the fulcrum point of this case. And that is the sincerity of the church, church's religious beliefs uh, regarding the parking lot. What did they do? The church said, and their minister and, and folks that are in the, in the, as part of the uh, parish, they said, this is part of our stewardship of the land. This is part of our ev evangelization. They had oftentimes talked to people that were um, parking there, and they felt that, that it was part of their mission was to provide, um, to provide free parking so that they could, uh, people could enjoy the land. And the court said, or who are we, who are we to infer what is right and what is wrong and what is sincerity. It's a very difficult thing for the court to infer sincerity. And so the court sort of looked at it and flipped it around and said, uh, the question here when it comes to sincerity and whether or not there's a substantial burden is, is this person or organization trying to defraud the court? That's sort of what they looked at. Are they, are they, are they just kind of passing it off and saying it's a religious belief or not? And basically what the, the court came down with is not a final decision per se, but it just said they presented a, a likelihood of prevailing on the merits uh, of a substantial burden claim the church did by saying this is for evangelization and we, help, we hold these beliefs sincerely. It's a very interesting case. Canaan Christian Church, this is Montgomery County, Maryland. Um, the next two cases are, are fairly similar, even though they land on different sides of the, of the, I guess, the arguments. So property owner, church, uh, they were contracted, contracted to sell their properties. Um, I, I guess the property owner was contracted with the church to sell the property. Um, and this, uh, the denial of the water and sewer category change request uh, sort of inhibited that purchase. Um, church obviously wanted to buy the property to build a church there. There's a lot of things argued in this case, including the Equal Protection Clause, Free Exercise Clause. And sort of the really important point here is that prior to um, the property owner and the church getting into negotiations, the county had already adopted its master plan that stated that no public sewer should be permitted for any use. They also had a, a, a different plan. I think it might have been the water and sewer plan that said that there should be no sewer extensions in that area. This was all prior to, you know, the, this, um, the property owner and the church kind of going together. And the really important thing is that there was, the court just found that there was no reasonable expectation that the church could use the property for the proposed uh, religious use. You got to have that reasonable expectation. That's sort of the prong of a RELUPA analysis. And they just couldn't find that there was any kind of religious, uh, reasonable expectation to use the property for, a, I think it was a, maybe a, a large, I can't remember the number of con congregants that they were going to have, but they just, it was too big for that area. Next slide. Fairly similar case. Uh, again, this is with the um, Fourth Circuit. So church looking to uh, build a uh, build a larger church on a different piece of property. I think this was going to be 2,000 congregants. Um, 
what they looked at was, and they were denied, they were denied the application for a water and sewer uh, permit. And um, one of the things that they looked at that I thought would be relevant to you all is um, the definition of zoning. The definition of zoning uh, is found in RELUPA in the federal statutes, but you're also gonna find it in state statutes, local. Um, they said for analysis of RELUPA, which is a federal statute, you need to look at the definition, the federal definition, not the state or local. Under state, this might have turned out differently, but under the federal law and under the federal statute, um, this amendment to the water and county sewer plan sort of fell under quote unquote zoning under a lupa. So that was a really interesting point. Next slide. So um, the, I think the most important thing here is that the church had a reasonable expectation uh, here. And that was different than the previous case. There was a reasonable expectation just through talking uh, with county officials um, and that th the other important thing is that the county failed to show that the denial of the application was the least restrictive means of furthering its interest. So remember, strict scrutiny applies here. Next slide. This is my last slide. Um, this is uh, First Circuit up in New Hampshire. Church brought an action alleging the town's denial of its application to uh, permit an electric electronic sign. And so um, they argued a bunch of different things. They argued that parts of the sign ordinance were unconstitutional. The court said, we're not looking at other, the other parts of the sign ordinance. We're looking at the, the part of the sign ordinance that you are saying um, is invalid, not the entire sign ordinance, um, thing called severability. And they, they went at length and discussed that. Um, one of the things that's really important when we talk about RELUPA um, is the equal terms. Do you, are you treating this, this religious institution on equal terms as something similar, some other area of assembly? And the, um, the plaintiff in this case, there are I mean, signs for Jesus. They, they were saying, um, you know, there, there's, a private, there's a public school that has an electronic sign in this district. There is the, uh, the Department of Highways right down the street from us that has an electronic sign. Uh, you all are not treating us on equal terms, which is important in a RELUPA analysis. And the court basically said, neither one of those uh, groups or neither one of those entities are, are good comparators, which is important. Uh, they're not subject to Pembroke's um, sign ordinance. The, the New Hampshire statutes allow uh, public schools and allow obviously a state agency to not be beholden to local uh, ordinances. And so um, what they ended up coming up with was that the provision that Pembroke had prohibiting the electronic signs outside the commercial district did not violate the First Amendment, not violate uh, RELUPA. Okay. Thanks, Jared. So now, um, well, first, yeah, I've been looking at the, the chat and we've got people from all over, a good group from West Virginia, a lot of Hokie fans out there, some of my former students. So welcome everybody again. Big regulatory takings case in the United States Supreme Court uh, in 2021. Uh, Cedar Point Nursery versus Hassad. This has created quite a buzz in the legal community. California statute allowed uh, labor unions to come on to the property of the business at certain times to basically recruit members to the labor union. They came on to the property of Cedar Point Nursery um, and Cedar Point Nursery did not want them on the property. Um, and they, they came onto the property anyway, they recruited members, and actually they had some protests and demonstrations on the property. 
So Cedar Point uh, filed suit for a regulatory taking. And for my former students, pull out your flow chart now. Um, but to prove a regulatory taking, uh, which is generally extremely difficult to do, um, the plaintiff can, can go one of three different ways. Uh, the first two ways are what we call categorical taking. Um, and Cedar Point relied on one of those categorical takings, basically that allowing the labor union to come onto their property was a physical invasion. And under uh, the U.S. Constitution, if the government physically takes your property, that's automatically a, a taking, and we don't have to go any further. And that is, if you can make it fit under the physical taking, you have a much easier way to go. And so the big fight in here was, was this a physical invasion? And the court cases say permanent physical invasion. So one of the debates between the majority and the dissent, this was a six to three decision, was the labor unions weren't on the property 365 days a year, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The majority rejected that and said, we don't think that it has to be 365, 24, seven. And in fact, the court kind of got around that by saying that this is an easement. So they compared it to an easement which gives your neighbor the right to go through your property as a driveway to get to their property that's landlocked. So an easement is the right to use the property of another. The court said this is akin to an easement and, uh, and the easement is there 365, 24 seven. Um, so this is a physical invasion and it's a taking. Another argument was that it, going back to one of Jared's Ralupa cases, well, this isn't an easement under state law. It doesn't qualify. And the court said it doesn't matter. Um, if it's comparable to an easement, it's an easement. If it quacks like an easement and waddles like an easement, it's an easement. So this is a really important case because some earlier right to farm cases that had held right to farm laws to be a taking had used the same analysis and said that a right to farm law is basically an easement which allows the, the farmer to use the neighbor's property to spew dust and odors and noise. So I think right to farm statutes might be in trouble. Um, and I have a friend who is using this case to file all kinds of lawsuits against COVID shutdowns, um, against a lot of different things. And I've talked to a lot of local governments who are concerned because, you know, a lot of times local government employees will access the property to do inspections and things like that. Now, the court mentioned that in the opinion, but it wasn't really clear on it. Um, so we're not really sure what's going to happen. Um, but it's definitely going to generate a lot of litigation, I think. Now, in the Clayland Farms case, and we talked about this uh, last year, but this is a continuation, <clears throat> excuse me, of the Clayland Farms case. It was appealed to the Fourth Circuit. Uh, Clayland had 106 acres in Talbot County. Um, they were going to put a, a development on it. Talbot County uh, put a moratorium on development on subdivisions uh, because they wanted time to work on their comprehensive sewer plan 
to make it consistent with the comprehensive plan. At, during that time, they changed the zoning from village center to resource conservation, which reduced the value and development potential of the property greatly. So Clayland Farms filed suit, said this is a taking. Well, they couldn't say really that it was a physical taking. The next step is, did it deprive Clayland of all or virtually all economically viable uses of the property? They couldn't really say that either. So they had to go to the third part of the regulatory takings uh, test, the Penn Central balancing test. And when we apply Penn Central balancing, we say we look at the economic impact of the ordinance on the landowner, the landowner's reasonable investment backed expectations, and the character of the governmental activity. The court did a great job, I think, of going through those three factors. The first factor, it reduced the value of the property by 40%. And the court said that's a lot, but we've said that 83% reduction is not a taking in some cases. So that's not enough. They can still use the property. Secondly, uh, reasonable investment backed expectations. The court said in this case, um, no landowner has the right to assume that their zoning was never going to change. It's unreasonable for them to think it's not going to change. And no landowner has the right to use the property for whatever they want or for the highest value use. It just has to be reasonable. So that weighed in favor of uh, the county. The third factor, however, the court really didn't like the length of the moratorium. It was six years long. And they really didn't like that the, the county said, we need that delay to work on our comprehensive plan. I think the court was saying you should have been doing that all along instead of waiting until this development was proposed. So that factor weighed in favor of Clayland, but in balancing all of the factors, the court said not a regulatory taking here. Okay, now this is to me one of the most interesting and developing areas of land use law, zoning for guns and for shooting. And a lot of these cases are from Pennsylvania this time around, uh, but they're really popping up all over the country. Uh, in this particular case, um, in the Third Circuit Court of Appeals and Federal Court out of Pennsylvania, um, a gun club wanted to put a gun club in Robinson Township. Um, the, the township, according to the gun club, stalled the application and had regulations that essentially meant that they couldn't have a gun club in that township. So some gun rights organizations and the gun club uh, filed a 1983 action against the township. And 1983 is a federal statute that basically allows you to use that as an umbrella to bring in some constitutional claims. And they said, it violates my second amendment rights to zone this gun club out of existence. The Court of Appeals had never seen a case like this before, so it was first impression. And the good news for the township was that they applied intermediate scrutiny not strict scrutiny. The bad news is that the court basically said, local government, you can't just say guns are bad, so we're going to zone them out of town. 
you have to, it, to me, it's similar to a sign ordinance or to a sexually oriented business ordinance. You can't just zone them out. They're all of those uses are protected by the Constitution, just like the Second Amendment. The court said, you have to show us why you're doing this and why your ordinance is tailored sufficiently to meet your goals. It's not enough to say guns are bad. You have to show us some reasoning, some rationale, and you have to show us that what you're doing is basically the minimal that you can do to address the problems that you're going to try to address. So the local government uh, did not prevail in this situation. Again, out of Pennsylvania, this was in state court um, and the, the state intermediate or the Commonwealth Court overruled the trial court. The trial court had said that the township did not violate the Second Amendment rights, um, but the appellate court overruled that and said, the Second Amendment, and this is another theme which I find really interesting. The Second Amendment does not only apply to the right to carry a gun, but it applies to the right to maintain proficiency in firearm use. And when the township essentially banned all target shooting uh, in the township except in two different zoning districts. Um, and, and nobody could do target shooting uh, at their personal residence. Again, the court said, you haven't shown us that that ordinance did not burden conduct more than what is reasonably necessary in this case. So local governments are gonna to have to show the court why they are limiting uh, gun use or target shooting, any of these types of things. Uh, two more cases. In the only case that, that the uh, regulating agency, in this case, the state of Commonwealth of Virginia prevailed, it was a COVID order. It was an executive order shutting down public access to shooting ranges. And again, the Virginia Circuit Court in this case said, the right to bear arms extends to the right to train, but not to a private shooting range. Now, whether that decision was swayed by the fact that it was a COVID order or not, I don't know, uh, but Virginia prevailed in that case. The last case was out of the federal court in Illinois. And in that case, uh, the rule prevented concealed carry permit holders from carrying a firearm in the forest preserve zoning district. And like the other cases that we talked about, the court said that's overly broad. And you know, what purpose does it serve to say that I can't uh, carry a concealed weapon in the forest preserve area, even if I have a permit. So that's another case where the court said, you know, show me, show me why you're doing this. Really brief look at short-term rentals. Um, and I commend you if you wanna learn more about short-term rentals, Christy, and Demu Christy Demuth and I did a deep dive on that a couple of weeks ago and that's on the YouTube channel. But some basic principles that we can get from a ton of cases around the country. Number one, regulating short-term rentals is not a regulatory taking. Like I said, hard to prove that and short-term rental uh, operators have not been able to do it. Number two, and this is true anywhere in land use planning, I think, definitions are really important. And in particular, how you define family, how you define dwelling, how you define residential, and how you define vacation home, if that's in your regulation. 
are very important to determining whether you can regulate short-term rentals and how. Uh, you can basically define family to exclude short-term rentals. And most courts have supported that. Uh, the Ninth Circuit has ruled that platforms can be required to comply with local regulations and platforms can be required to give information to the local government so that they can know where these short-term rentals are. Um, what's gonna cause you some problems um, is where the local government uh, tries to limit the number of renters and tries to limit outside assembly, uh, imposes curfews, that starts to implicate freedom of speech, freedom of association. Uh, the city of Austin had a very stringent ordinance that limited the number of people who can congregate outside of a short-term rental and had a 10 p.m. curfew. Uh, the court uh, struck that down, so be careful when you do that. A promising approach, which the court mentioned in Austin, is to use a nuisance ordinance to address those types of concerns with short-term rentals. Okay, now we're into our potpourri of uh, local zoning cases. And some of these are pretty crazy. Um, the first one's out of Maryland, Montgomery County, Maryland. And this is one that I don't think the court liked the outcome, but again, it, it really depends on the words that you use in the ordinance. The ordinance said the maximum um, footprint for an accessory building is 50% of the main building or 600 square feet, whichever is greater. Ian Cruz and the court said, count them. Cruz has seven accessory buildings. Um, the total square footage of those is 1,870 square feet. His residence is only 1,176 square feet. But Cruz said the ordinance provide, applies to each accessory building separately. And the court said, we're reading the ordinance. It says, an accessory building. An is singular. Cruz is right. That ordinance, the way it's written, means that the maximum footprint for one accessory building is 50% of the main building or 600 square feet, whichever is greater. Mr. Cruz can keep all seven of his accessory buildings and he can put more in if he wants to. Ken Sayer is heckling me. Uh, yes, Ken, words do matter. I don't know if Mr. Cruz could put a pancakes, biscuits and more uh, in an accessory building, but uh, maybe he could. Um, this is a crazy case, everybody, really crazy, out of Warren County, Virginia. And I grew up uh, in Frederick County, Virginia, so I, I know there's somebody from Shenandoah County here, so a uh, shout out to you. But this is a case where it looked like the local government was singling out one landowner and picking on him while other landowners had the same violation and they weren't picking on him. Uh, this was in the special flood hazard area. Um, they went after Mr. Mendez for certain uh, violations that were, in were alleged. He came back and said, number one, how did they find this out? Because you have to come on my property to, to see this. And number two, there are other people who, who have the same violation um, and, and they are not, there's no enforcement action against them. Well, the court said you can have a class of one for equal protection claim. So it stays in. 
These claims were against the county, the zoning administrator, the planning director, and the floodplain manager. And the court said the floodplain manager admitted to entering into the property. They didn't see any legal reason for the floodplain manager to be on the property. It's not authorized. Um, therefore, that at least the case has been stated that that is an unreasonable search and seizure. Um, and so the case against the floodplain manager uh, stayed in. Um, the claims against the county were kicked out and the Fourth Amendment claims against the zoning administrator and the planning director were dismissed. But that means that that equal protection claim and those punitive damages request stayed in against the zoning director, zoning administrator, and the planning director. They're going to go to the jury, and that should be scary. Um, so watch out about picking on certain landowners. Um, this is kind of similar. Um, where and it's out of Virginia too. I don't know what's happening in Virginia, y'all, but this is Matthews County. Um, and Eubanks received a notice of violation that he had a four foot expansion of a non conforming structure. And Eubanks responded and said, The footprint of this house has not changed for 50 years, for more than 50 years. So how could this be a violation? I didn't expand it. Um, the county answered that by filing a criminal action um, and Eubanks prevailed. He was found not guilty. So Eubanks turned around and filed a malicious prosecution and abuse of process claim against the county. And this is fascinating too. Eubank said, county just wants my property cheap so that they can have access to the water. Um, and the court said the pleadings were sufficient that you can keep continuing that claim uh, on the malicious prosecution claim. The abuse of process claim was kicked out. A couple of variance cases that I think are just nutty um, and, and you all know me, in addition to Dylan's rule, I'm known for being a real hard ass about variances. Uh, and I think they're granted when they shouldn't be. Well, out in Nebraska, this is a crazy variance. Um, landowner built a pig pen on one corner of their property. Um, it was too close uh, to the neighbor's property. It violated the setback. Um, the opinion and the Board of Adjustment made a lot about, well, they wanted to have these pigs to teach their kids uh, how to take care of things and how to be responsible, and they were going to enter into Nebraska Cooperative Extension contests and things like that. The Board of Adjustment commented on the cleanliness of the pens when they went and visited. That's all irrelevant. Um, they could have moved the pen to another corner of the property, but the court upheld the variance um, and said that this would be an undue hardship to the landowners to make them move their pig pen. Crazy case. Um, Another variance case, um, I included this for you, University of Virginia graduates, because there was a pergola involved. Um, I think this is just a fun case, because why in the world was it even here anyway? Um, the Board of Adjustment in this case granted a variance from the setback so that the neighbor could install a pergola on an existing patio. Um, the district court denied the petition. The Court of Appeals affirmed that. It had to go all the way up to the Supreme Court of Iowa 
um, for them to say, whoa, 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 we shouldn't be granting variances for landowners to put pergolas on their property that violate the setback. And even if we would, would want to do something like that, the landowner didn't show that their plight was due to like weird shape of the property or size of the property or steep slopes. It was just that that's where they wanted to put their pergola. So crazy case. Well, that was a really quick review of some of the outstanding um, or some of the more interesting uh, land use law cases in the United States in the past um, year or so. We appreciate you staying here to this point. And Jared and I are ready, willing, and able to try to answer your questions. All right, so we're gonna go through some questions. Um, any questions that we cannot get to, we will send to the presenters uh, to follow up with you. Um, it looks like we got one from Sam earlier during um, when you were speaking about Eubank versus Thomas. Um, Sam said, would plain view apply here if seen from outside of property? Yes, I think if you can see whatever the alleged violation is from outside of the property, you're fine. But in this case, that was impossible, and the zoning or the floodplain uh, official had to actually trespass. Uh, don't forget, everybody, if you'd like to ask a question live, just raise your hand um, using the raise your hand feature at the bottom of your screen, and I will unmute you um, so you can ask directly. Maybe, Jared, do you want to talk about the question that you got in the Q&A box in case people weren't able to read that? Sure. So um, I, the question went to the, the OTARD rule. And basically, the question was, if you had a distributed wireless network, the FCC now says that the exterior equipment now falls under OTARD and is thus exempted from limitations associated with HOAs and local governments. I, I think that, uh, sure, I think just as it's stated, I think that's correct um, with the caveats that um, there's still limitations um, with the OTAR rule and that um, basically what the FCC is saying is that any antenna that is used to receive or transmit fixed wireless signals for the distribution of fixed wireless services to multiple customer locations um, falls under this rule uh, that was uh, delivered January of this year. So there's an expansion of the, the OTARD rule to mainly for fixed wireless and hu hub and relay services. It right, looks like we have another question. Um, this is from Luke. On the union access case, was the fact of the property being open to employees, non-owners, a relevant fact? Example given, because the owners had opened the property to certain individuals, farm workers, they implied an easement for certain support functions related to those employees. If I understand the question correctly, I think it was argued that Basically, and there's, I've taught property law at law school, and there's a case in our property law textbook uh, that's basically contrary to this. Um, and there's this notion that, as the questioner said, well, the farm workers are on the property, so why can't somebody come on the property perhaps to give them medical care or educational uh, support or something of that nature. And that was argued in the case, um, but the court, and it gets kind of complicated, but the court basically said, trespass and takings are different. 
Um, one of the biggest sticks in the bundle, some of you have heard about property being like a stick, of, like a bundle of sticks. And the court said one of the sticks in the bundle is the right to exclude others. And in this case, the owner of the property didn't want uh, these people coming onto his property to recruit for the union. Um, if it would have been a different context, would the result have been different? I'm not sure. Um, and I think one thing that, that makes a difference too, are these farm workers housed on the work site or are they housed off of the work site? So if they're housed off the work site, then presumably those union organizers can come to where they reside and they don't have to come on to the work premises. But if their housing is on the work premises, then they really have to come onto the premises to provide those services. So all of those things were argued and the court came down with it's an easement, it's a taking. I think some of the things that you're talking about there um, are gonna be argued in the future in, in similar cases. So I think it's gonna be interesting to see what happens in the future. All right, we have another question from Douglas. In the Warren County case, wouldn't the county's floodplain management ordinance specify the conditions under which the local floodplain administrator could enter the property? Well, this might be an instance where I can, can use Dylan's rule. Um, it really doesn't depend on the uh, local ordinance. It depends on the enabling authority that that local government is given. And the court said that the state erosion and sediment control provisions did not allow uh, the floodplain administrator to go onto the property. And I remember bits and pieces about erosion and sediment control, but I can't remember exactly. I thought it was a little unusual that the floodplain administrator couldn't come onto the property. Um, but apparently there is no state authority for that. And we have an issue with that in West Virginia where our state statutes give very little authority for um, local government officials to go onto the property. And we actually recently amended a statute to actually provide for a process to get an administrative search warrant to do that. So maybe that would have been appropriate in Virginia as well, um, because to do a search, you have to have probable cause. And to do that, you have to get a search warrant. And so uh, maybe an administrative search warrant would have been appropriate. Grace has a question of what precedent affirms that the Second Amendment accounts for training, maintaining shooting skills? I don't know, Jerry, do you shoot guns more than I do? But uh, so you might know, but I don't think there's any precedent uh, until now. Uh, this is pretty new stuff um, and courts are kind of feeling their way. Um, I'm not aware of any precedent that says that until these cases, um, but uh, things are really evolving quickly on that. Do you want to add anything on that, Jaren? All right, any more questions? Great. As mentioned earlier, this webinar is being recorded and will be posted on our APA or on the Mid-Atlantic Planning Collaboration YouTube page. Um, all of our registrants will receive a follow-up email with a recap of this presentation, as well as the link to the video, along with the presenter's contact information if you have any remaining questions for them. Thanks, Thank everybody. Go Hokies. <laughs> Go Mountaineers. Thank you for joining today. <laughs>